Hey everybody, what's up and welcome back. If you're new here, I'm Liz and this is Crime Time, Korean Crime Time, whatever the hell you want to call it. Today we're going to be talking about a case from my hometown. So, yes, we're going to be talking about Hannah Dustin. Uh, not a lot of people are going to know who she is, but you're welcome for uh, any history that I'm going to give you. Uh, she was born Hannah Emerson on the 23rd of December in 1657. This is an old case. She was born in Haverhill, Massachusetts. That's where I'm from. You're welcome. So, Hannah, she was born to Michael Emerson and Hannah Emerson. She was the oldest of 15 children. At the age of 20, she did marry her husband, Thomas Dustin Jr., and he was a farmer and a brickmaker. Now, her family was already known because known of in the area due to her sister, Elizabeth. Now, Elizabeth was hanged for infant, infanticide, so killing an infant, on June 8th of 1693. And... One of her cousins, Martha Toothaker Emerson, um, and her father, Roger Toothaker, were accused of practicing witchcraft and tried during the Salem Witch Trials. So, she's got some deep-rooted, you know, family heritage. So, you're probably wondering why I'm talking about this woman we're going to be, and especially why I'm talking about it after the Ardenwald axe murders. This kind of deals with a little bit of axes, but not really. We're going to be talking about scalping and what happens during times of war and conflict, conflict especially when it comes to um, early settling in America and in these areas. So... This happened during the King William's War. So Hannah and her husband Thomas, along with their nine children, which included a newborn baby named Martha, they were obviously living in Haverhill. Now on the 15th of March of 1697, this is when Hannah was 40 years old. The town was raided by a group of about 30 Abenaki Indians from Quebec. Now, in this attack, there was about 27 colonists that were killed, and most of them were children, and 13 were taken to either be adopted or held hostage for the French. So Hannah's husband, um, and he was building a new brick home at the time, about a half a mile away, fled with eight of their children. That left Hannah and their newborn Martha, and unfortunately, Hannah and Martha including obviously her nurse as well. Her nurse's name is Mary Neff. Um, they were forced to march into the wilderness with these Abenaki. And Hannah was carrying Martha at the time. Now, according to an account that Hannah gave to a man named Cotton Mather, uh, the captors killed baby Martha by smashing her head against a tree. Now, Martha was only six days old at the time. What a tragic way to go. So, now this is a direct quote that I have from a passage. About 19 or 20 Indians now led these away, with about half a score of English captives, but ere they had gone many steps, they dashed out the brains of the infant against, against a tree and several of the other captives, uh, as they began to tire in the sad journey, were soon sent unto their long home. So Hannah and Mary were then assigned to a family, a family group of about 12 people, and this is possibly uh, Pentecooks. So if you're not familiar with a lot of the tribes that were in this area, or if you're not familiar with, like, Places in Massachusetts, a lot of places are named after the different tribes. Like Pentecook is a very popular name in Haverhill. Abenaki is a very popular name in southern New Hampshire. So there's a lot of like taking a name and using it elsewhere when it comes from the Native American tribes. So 
they were taken by, well, taken and assigned to a family group of the Pentecooks. They were taken north, and this was somewhere beyond Pentecook. And they still told these, like, these women um, when they came into the town that they must be stripped and scourged and run against the gauntlet uh, through the entire army of Indians so that they were going, literally going to be beaten and pillaged. So along in this group was a a person by the name of Samuel Leonardson. Now, Samuel Leonardson was a 14-year-old boy who was captured in Worcester in late 1695. So there's a lot of people that were captured and later um, it was discovered that they were found or they like knew exactly where they went because of what Hannah spoke about after, after, after everything she went through. So yeah, yeah. They were taken north to an island in the Merrimack River, and this is near the mouth of the Kentucket River, which Kentucket is another popular name in Native American culture. And this is where during the night of either the 29th or the 30th of April, while the Native Americans were sleeping, Hannah led Mary and Samuel in a revolt. Now, what she did was, is she used a hatchet to kill one of the two grown men. Um, and Leonard said Samuel ended up killing the second one. And they ended up as well uh, killing two adult children and uh, two adult women and six children. According to, again, this is from Cotton Mather's account, um, Hannah and her partners led one of the children, like, led one of the children while they were semi asleep, intending to bring them away with them, but the boy awoke and he escaped. One of the severely wounded Abenaki women. Um, also managed to escape the attack. So another quote from this um, transcript is, furnishing themselves with hatchets for the purpose, they struck home such blows upon the head of their sleeping oppressors that ere they could any of them struggle, they fell down dead. So after they scalped them, um, they left on a canoe and after the scalping happened, which if you don't know what scalping is, is basically taking off your scalp, um, as proof of the in incident so they could collect a bounty. They ended up going down river, traveling only during the night. And after several days, they had gone back to Haverhill. So a few days later from this, Hannah's reunited with her husband, Thomas, and he brings them to Boston, Hannah, Samuel, and Mary. And along with them, they also bring the scalps from the Abenaki and the Pentecooks with a hatchet and also with a flintlock musket um, that they had taken from the Native Americans that held them captive. Now, although New Hampshire um, had just become a colony, like, in 1680, the Merrimack River and its little territories around it were still considered Massachusetts. So this meant that Hannah and the other captives would have to apply in Massachusetts for the scalp bounty. Basically, this is that Massachusetts posted that you could get about 50 pounds per scalp in September of 1694, um, which was then reduced to 25 pounds in June of 1695 and then completely repealed in 1696. And as we know, wives didn't have any legal status. They didn't have anything. So Thomas then had to apply for Hannah. And in the request, he had to request that the scalps be paid, even though there was a law providing that it was all repealed. So basically what had happened is he filed this and Massachusetts General Court voted to give them a reward for killing their captors because of everything that they went through, 
Hannah ended up receiving 25 pounds. And then Mary and Samuel also received 25 pounds. And they split another 25 pounds. So it's after all of this happens, Hannah gives birth to another child. She has a, a daughter named Lydia. And um, she is born on October 4th of 1698. Now, her neighbor, Hannah Heath Bradley, she was also abducted in the raid in 1697, and two of her children were killed. And she was held for nearly two years before she was ransomed and returned to Haverhill in 1699. Well, that's not the only time that Haverhill was basically invaded. It was invaded again during the Queen Anne's War. Um, and this happened between in 1704 and 1707. And another raid happened in 1708. And that's when the Algonquin and the Abenaki Indians that were led by a French official, Jean-Baptiste Hertel de Rouville, um, they killed 16 people in town, including the town minister. Now, Although she baptized Lydia, Hannah rarely attended church and she didn't take communion until later in her life. And a lot of people didn't understand why until like, until she asked to be formally admitted to the congregational church. And this was in May of 1724. Now you got to imagine if she's if she was held captive and she saw her baby die right in front of her. Obviously, she's got a lot of things that she needs to process, and she probably doesn't want to be. I mean, no matter what denomination you are, you probably don't want to be surrounded by people that, I mean, are happy and are trying to devote themselves to God where she's stuck in such a, like a small, she feels so small place. I don't believe that there, I mean, there could be some people that just want to surround themselves by that, but there are some people that can't. So it's understandable why she didn't want to. So Thomas had a similar petition for the church and that happened in January of the fall of that same year, actually. So it's believed that Hannah died between 1736 and 1738. There's not really a definitive year of when she died. So Samuel, that was also involved in this, he moved to Preston, Connecticut, and he joined his father down there. He married, he had five children, and he would die in 1718. Mary Neff would, wouldn't perish until 1722. And her son, Joseph Neff, he... Uh, was granted 200 acres of land in at Penacook um, by the General Court of New Hampshire in consideration for his mother's services in assisting Hannah Dustin in killing several Indians. So there's a lot of different buildings that are still around when it comes to Hannah Dustin. There's also a, a marker in Bosco in New Hampshire for Hannah and basically it's they if you've ever seen one of these markers they're green and it talks a little bit about certain things so one of the bridges in Hayroll has a statue of Hannah in it there the Hannah Dustin house is still there there is a there's want to call it an old age home but it's not or a funeral home but it's not <laughs> there's a nursing home called Hannah Dustin my grandmother used to work there it's a really and it's all dedicated to Hannah and what she went through there's a lot of people mentioning her when it comes to New England history and people that interviewed her and talked to her like Cotton Mather the one that we have all the records from, um, and how he, let he, he talked to her a lot about her capture and how she felt. And he wrote a lot when it came to her story and trying to get people to understand. And 
comparing Hannah's story to that of the murder of Sisera by J.L. in the Old Testament in the Bible and how her narrative mirrors that of Hannah Swarton and Mary Rowlandson. Um, and they were both captured. One was in 1690 and the other one was 1675. So there was a lot of taking Hannah's story and kind of like comparing it to other women because a lot of people weren't talking about what was happening with the bad blood between the settlers and the Native Americans in the area. And also, Hannah, a lot of Hannah's story appears in the diary of a man named Samuel Sewell. And he heard the story directly from her on May 12th of 1697. Now, Samuel Sewell was a judge and a businessman and a printer in, prov in the province of Massachusetts Bay. And he was highly known for his involvement in the Salem Witch Trials. And of which he later apologized, and he had an essay called The Selling of Joseph, um, and he cr would criticize slavery, and he just tried to make better of his life. Well, Hannah Dustin's story appears in his diary, and when he heard it from her less than two weeks after she escaped. Now, Samuel also adds to the detail the night before their escape, and that's about the detail that one of the captors showed Samuel how to take a scalp from a person. Now, basically, it says August 29th is, um, thank you, Apple Watch, is signalized by the achievement of Hannah Dustin, Mary Neff, and Samuel Leonardson, who killed two men, their masters, two women, and six others, and have brought in ten scalps. Hannah Dustin came to see us on May 12th, she said her master, whom she killed, did formerly live with Mr. Rulinson at Lancaster, so Lancaster, New Hampshire. The single man showed the night before to Sam Leonardson how to use a knock Englishman on the head and take the scalp. Little thinking of, like, the captives would make sense of how to do this. Same, that same person that Samuel Leonard said killed is the same one that showed him how to scalp somebody. So there's also more of Hannah's story in John Marshall's diary, and he was a bricklayer in Quincy. And he wrote that at the latter end of this month, two women and a young lad had been taken captive from Haverhill in March before, watching their opportunity when the Indians were asleep, killing 10 of them, scalped them all, and came home to Boston. They bought a gun. Well, they brought a gun with them and other things. The chief of these Indians took one of the women hostage when she had lain in childbed but a few days and knocked her child in the head before her eyes, which woman killed and scalped that very Indian. She also appears in another, like two other diaries. One is on of John Pike and the other one is in a letter that's dated March. May 17th of 1724, and that's addressed to elders of the church that she belonged to. So, in the letter, well, in the diary of John Pike, it says, March 15th, the Indians fell upon some part of Haverhill about 7 in the morning, killed and carried away 39 to 40 persons. Two of these captive women were Hannah Dustin and Mary Neff, with another young man slew 10 of the Indians, returned home with these scalps. And in the letter to the elders, it simply says, I am thankful for my captivity. Twas the comfortablest time I've ever had. In my affliction, God made his words comfortable to me. So after Cotton Mather's death, uh, Hannah Dustin's story was like largely forgotten until it was brought to life in the book that was published by Timothy Dwight IV, and that was Travels in New England and New York. This was published in 1821. After this, Hannah became more famous in the 19th century when her story was retold by Nathaniel Hawthorne, John Greenleaf Whittier, and Henry Thoreau. So Henry David Thoreau's character version adheres, like, takes information 
that's provided in primary sources, whereas John Greenleaf Whittier describes her with a thirst for revenge, an insatiable longing for blood, an instantaneous, instantaneous uh, change, like, had been brought in her very nature, and the angel had become a demon, and she followed her captors with a stern determination and embraced the earliest opportunity of bloody retribution. Now, Nathaniel Hawthorne was clearly horrified um, and had a hard time with his retelling. And he basically, but oh, the children, their skins are red, yet spare them. Hannah Dustin, spare those seven little ones for the sake of the seven that have fed at your own breast. So if you didn't know, they wrote about her. <laughs> um, and John Greenleaf Whittier is a very big name in Essex County, Massachusetts. Um, one of the schools I went to was named after him. So, um, basically, her Hannah story became very popularized with different writs throughout literature. And there's a lot of tales that have sparked because of this, of whether she was bloodthirsty or whether it was just for, like, revenge and what do you think went through her mind. But with all these diary entries we have and all of these testimonies we have, it's we can see that some, some aspects still can be unclear and some, are, like, are clear. Um, this was also illustrated, so the massacre was also illustrated in a painting by Junius Brutus Stearns, and this is called Hannah Dustin Killing the Indians, and this was painted in 1847, of which Junius, for whatever reasons remain unclear, depicts Samuel Leonardson as a woman, so it shows that there's three women, not a one man and two women. And that the children that Hannah killed were not in the picture. There was a second painting that showed Hannah's husband, Thomas, fleeing with her kids. And that is now lost. Nobody knows where that is. Um, so there's also a book that called Nick of the Woods. And that is basically talks about like the subject matter of Native Americans and violent revenge. From 1820 to 1870, Hannah's story was in nearly all American history books, as well as many biographies and children's books and magazine articles. The story was so popular among like white Americans when the country was like engaged in the Western expansion. And it, this is what also helped fuel the fire between the people moving West and the Native American groups that were living in places where the settlers wanted to live. So in the 1830s and after, the story was partly like washed out by not mentioning the killing of the six children. There was also more versions that added like numerous details that weren't a thing, like giving names to the Indians that we didn't know, different dialogues that happened. And there's no primary source for any of these. So, and one of these is actually called The Heroism of Hannah Dustin. That came out in 1875 and that's by Robert Booty Haverly. Um, so, there is a history of Haverhill that was recorded in 1832, and this is where it adds details of Hannah only wearing one shoe when she was captured, that her daughter was thrown against an apple tree, from which local people remembered eating fruit from, and that the captives had already started down the stream, or the river, and Hannah insisted that they return to take the scalps from them. All in all, there is six memorials dedicated to her. The first one was 
erected in 1852, well, began in 1852, and this is a simple white marble column. And at the time, it cost uh, $1,350. And this one, so this one kind of has been like resold in different places. Um, yeah, it's, this one was basically, they wanted it to be a memorial for Hannah and her daughter, Martha, but some people were upset with the monument and they didn't want it where it was going. Like there was one particular place that they wanted it to be. And then some people wanted it at Haverhill Commons. Well, they were sued and the builders had to remove the monument in 1865 and they erased the inscription on it and engraved a new one. But then they resold it to the town of Barr and this is where it stands to this day. Um, basically, and where it is right now is in the memorial for the Civil War soldiers. So... The first successful monument that was erected was in 1874, and this is known as the Hannah Dustin Memorial State Historic Site. Um, this memorial actually mentions um, the like the people that were executed, and this was by William Andrews. He was a marble worker from Lowell. There was an attorney named Robert Booty that raised $6,000 from 450 people to erect this, and this was 35 feet tall. And it depicts Hannah with a hatchet in one hand and 10 scalps in the other. And it was dedicated June 17th of 1874 on the island in Boscoen, New Hampshire, where Hannah killed her captors. And the inscription on it reads, the war whoop, tomahawk, faggot, infant sides were at Haverhill. The ashes of wigwam campfires at night and of 10 of the tribes are here. So there were people that were, like there was 5,000 people that overwhelmed this island on the day of its dedication. They were speechless all day and there was speeches. So literally people were tongue-tied. People were talking about this. They were and this was first publicly funded that it was the first publicly funded statue in New Hampshire and the first statue in the U S to honor a woman over the years. This statue in particular has been vandalized, including it's been shot in the face twice. The monument was defaced with splashes of red paint in May of 2020 and there, so people of the Kalasuk band of the Penacook Abenaki people have proposed adding another statue to the island park to honor the fallen Abenaki in order to tell a more complete story of the indigenous people of New England so that there's two sets to it. So one of Hannah and one of the fallen Abenaki. There's also plaques that with the historical information that are on the Merrimack and the Kentucky River and the old railroad track that goes to the island. Let's see, then there is a bronze statue in 1879 that shows Hannah grasping a hatchet that was created by Calvin H. Weeks. And this is in Haverhill Town Square, which is now called Grand Army Park and where it stands on the site of uh, Haverhill Center congregational church and that's where Hannah was a member. It depicts Hannah wearing only one shoe per Haverhill's tradition of the story. Um, however, um, October 31st of 1934, the hatchet was stolen, but it was later recovered and then welded back into place. On July 10th of 2020, uh, the words Haverhill's own monument to genocide was found written on the statue base in pink chalk. The statue was then vandalized again August 2020 with red paint. On Thanksgiving of 2021, she was then vandalized again with either red spray paint or splashes of red paint. And to prevent further vandaliz vandalization of the statue, city workers then draped the statue in blue plastic tarp 
and this was basically to cover her um, before it would be cleaned by the highway department or the DPW. Some of the residents of Hayroll have proposed that the statue should be removed because it promotes harmful stereotypes of warlike Indians. So I, I disagree with this because it's part of our, our history, especially where I'm from, Haverhill, and not a lot of people understand history and how good things come uh, because of bad things. And she survived being held captive by Indians that killed her child. And the only way for her to get away was to inflict injury on those. So if you don't agree with that, that's fine. That's your own beliefs. That's what I feel. Moving on to our third memorial. There, This one was erected in 1902. And this was placed by the Daughters of the American Revolution on a small plot of land at at Alds in Fifield Street in Nashua, and this is at the site of John Lovewell's house, which was part of Dunstable, New Hampshire, in Loveswell time. And this is where Hannah, Mary, and Samuel spent the night on their way home from captivity. The fifth memorial was is a milestone that was placed on the shores of the Merrimack River, and this is where they beached their canoe, and that was put there in December of 1902. The fifth memorial was created in 1908, and this has the inscription. It, it's an inscription placed in a boulder in memorial of both Hannah and Martha, and this is a 30-ton glacial erratic rock that was pulled out of Bradley Brook uh, when it was emptied like into Merrimack, near where Hannah landed her canoe after her escape. This was then placed at the site of Hannah's son, Jonathan's home in Haverhill. And this is where Hannah lived during her final years of life. Uh, there's also a memorial for Samuel Leonardson, and that is a bronze tablet. And this was dedicated to him October 22nd of 1910. And it hung on a 42 foot, um, on the 42-foot Davis Tower at Lake Park in Worcester at the site of his home, his boyhood home, and that's at the shore of Lake Quinnesegmond. Um, and it was stolen in 1969, just before the tower was demolished, and it has not been recovered. There's also a place called Mount Dustin, and this is, it says in Wentworth location, New Hampshire, and this is, this is a township in Coas County, which is our top county in New Hampshire. And this, this township actually, as of 2020, only has 20 people in it. Um, and this was named after Hannah in 1870, but it used an alternate spelling. So instead of O-N, it's A-N. So the original hatchet that she used to scalp them can be found in the Buttonwoods Museum. Now, the hatchet is not a tomahawk per the folklore that went around. It is usually called a Biscayan or Biscayan, um, and it's a common trade item of the late 17th century New England frontier, so it's something that was very common. It's on display with the knife she allegedly used to scalp her captors, along with a letter of confession petitioning to join the church. So... Obviously, there's been other commemorative things for her, like we have the Dustin House, which is the building that Thomas was building at the time of the, of the capture, and this is the house that still stands to this day. It is at 665 Hilldale Avenue, if you want to see it in person. It is quite beautiful. It has a, it has a little sign that says the Dustin House. Um, there was an elementary school that was called Hannah Dustin Elementary. And I know where that building is. It was opened on July 10th of 1911. It was closed in the 80s though. And there is also a Hannah Dustin Healthcare, which is located on Monument Street in Haverhill as well. So as of today, 
obviously this is still controversial for people. Some people celebrate her as a hero while others don't, given that she killed her captors. Some people have said that her legend is racist and glorifies violence, um, despite her freeing herself from captivity. Now, I didn't cover this case to have an argument with people. I covered this case simply because it is part of where I grew up and history like this is not talked about. History, talking about people that are captured by a group of people and then them using such force to get away from them is not talked about. And it should be because there's a lot of history like this that a lot of, a lot of people do not realize is what makes up our total U.S. history. So on that note, I hope you guys took something out of this case, whether it be that you think she's a racist, she th you think it's super controversial, or you might have an inkling of how Hannah might have felt. Either way, I hope you guys learned something from this case, and I will see you guys in another video. Bye, you guys.